Hi, my name is Mike Gabe and welcome to my KSP campaign. This is mission seven and we are on our way. Oh, wait a second. I should transmit some pressure data that I picked up while I was on the launch pad because science is a big part of this mission. Why don't we quickly talk about the vehicle because pretty soon these SRVs are going to be gone. Right now this thing is being pushed up by four back thumper SRVs. A part that you have seen before. What is new on this particular stage right now is the EAS4 strut connector. This is my first use of struts. Struts are a great way to stiffen up parts and they disappear when you stage those parts. So they are an excellent part to unlock as quickly as you can. The orbiter we have here is more than twice the payload of the little orbiter that Jeb flew up two episodes ago. We got quite a bit more going on, but uh, we got to stage these SRVs. Oh, there they go. More explosions. All right. Okay, why don't we take this opportunity now to talk about the next stage. We have a number of new parts here. I'll we'll start off with what's pushing this thing. It's the LVT-30 Reliant liquid fuel engine. It provides slightly better performance than the T5 swivels that were on my previous two rockets, in addition to being 250 kilograms lighter, but it lacks any gimbling. I figure I didn't need it because of two other new parts. We have four AVR8 winglets, which were also briefly seen in Mission 5. These are my first winglets with control surfaces, so while I have an atmosphere, these things are helping with attitude control. Also, beyond the reaction wheels that are in the capsule, there is an additional set of reaction wheels in the orbiter, which are also helping with attitude control. They would work best right now if they are more towards the center of the booster, but providing control during ascent is not their primary function. They're there for descent, but I'll get to that later. Also mounted on these are two Mark II R radial mount parachutes. And I've set the min pressure to be half an atmosphere. These are there to recover the booster, which I'll explain later. Okay, let's talk about the mission. Last episode, Jeb used a jet. I was able to grab a single focused survey of Kerbin at an altitude of over 18 kilometers. Well, we're gonna be doing nine of them, but it's not just about that, it's also about science. Speaking of which, here we go, we just did a pressure scan in the upper atmosphere. Now we got nine of them to do, and that's why we are going into a polar orbit. Uh, in a polar orbit, we're in an orbit, clearly we're going to be over 18 kilometers, but also as Kerbin rotates beneath our orbit, eventually each one of those is going to have to come underneath us. But as I mentioned, this is also about science. We built an orbiter that's able to, that has all the science equipment on it that I've collected so far. In fact, let's take a look and see if we can do a goo sample. Oh, well, yeah, might as well. But also aboard, we have Bob for the first time, our scientist, so he will be able to reset the mystery goo and the materials bay as often as he likes. As well, we got Bill along because while well, we had the extra seat, so I might as well fill it up. And getting an orbit will mean that all three of these Kerbals will go to level one once I hopefully successfully get them back down to the surface. Speaking of Bill and Bob, uh, undoubtedly you have noticed that uh, they don't quite look the way they do in the stock game. That's thanks to the Texture Replacer mod. Uh, I like my Kerbals all to kind of look different so I can tell them apart. I always keep Jeb and Val at the stock textures, but everybody else, well, they're going to get switched up. And, by the way, if you are interested in learning more about going into polar and other inclined orbits. I do have a tutorial on this that you might want to check out. In the meantime, I have cut forward to our circularization burn and I'll show you my trick for how I'm going to recover this booster stage. No extra mods required for this one. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at Kerbal Engineer and I'm keeping a careful eye on my time to apoapsis and my periapsis height. Oh, my Apple apps is getting away. Let's uh, cut engines here and uh, why don't we use this opportunity to arm the parachutes with menus that I have pinned over there on the right. 
they won't deploy because we are now in a vacuum. Now I want to push up my periapsis to about 50 kilometers. I'll get to why that number in just a moment. We stage, we will get back to that stage well, a little bit in the future. Right now though, we need to finish off our circularization with our orbiter, which of course means getting our periapsis up to about 80 kilometers. There we go, that looks pretty good. All right, let's zoom in here and take a look at our orbiter. In fact, what I really wanna focus on is this new part, this surface bay. Let's open this up and take a look at everything that I have jammed in here. First off, I have six of those Z100 battery packs that will provide quite a bit of electricity, but again, the only electrical generation I have comes from burning fuel, so I am going to have to be conscious of how I use electricity. Also in here is a mystery goo container, a thermometer, and a barometer, all of our science. But the one new part that is jammed in here is the small inline reaction wheel, which you can barely see, it's in the middle. And as I mentioned, I'm going to need that extra attitude control on re-entry, which you will be seeing soon enough later in this video. But uh, let's just say for now, the aerodynamic qualities of this crew module, well, they do leave a little bit to be desired. But with that service module now opened up, it's time to get Bob out there to clean up this science. Unfortunately, uh, the only way in and out is through the command capsule at the top. So we first have to EVA Valentina. We'll just sort of get her out of the way. There we go. That should be good. And then we have to transfer Bob over to the We'll transfer Bob over to the, the capsule, the Mark I capsule, and then we can EVA Bob. And rather than have two Kerbals out floating about, I think what might be for the best is to get Valentina back inside. And then we'll move her back. She can sort of stretch her legs back there in the crew cabin. We'll transfer her back because Bob's gonna be bouncing in and out for a little bit to collect EVA reports over the various biomes. But now Bob can go back there, he can collect the science from that materials bay. That science, by the way, was collected way back on the launch pad. But Bob, being a scientist, can collect that data, and then he can restore the materials bay back to its former self. And then we gotta take a look here inside the service bay where the rest of our science resides. And Bob's gonna be collecting all that, of course. Then we'll get Bob back inside. Oh, well, let's turn on the lights here, because I think we'll be probably going into the night side soon enough. And then we'll collect some more science. We are now in near space. None of this science is biome specific, so we might as well collect it now. But why don't we also take this opportunity to take a closer look at this orbiter. As already mentioned, it has all the science that I've unlocked to date. That includes the materials bay, mystery goo, the thermometer, and the barometer. And we'll be collecting as much science as we can, both from near space, and we do have a plan to get up to high space, which means getting uh, to an altitude of over 250 kilometers. Also attached to this thing are two Rastroprop monitor external cameras that you have caught glimpses of the images they are providing when I go to the internal views. Those are always nice things to have now that I can spare the part count with the upgraded vehicle assembly building. But let's get into what the new parts are. Pushing this whole thing is the LV909 Terrier liquid fuel engine with an ISP of 345 seconds in vacuum. This is one of the most efficient engines, or at least chemical engines in the game, and it makes an ideal orbital engine. Also new is the Mark I crew cabin where Bill, well, Bill and Valentina, Bill and Bob were there, Bill and Valentina are there now. And with the Mark I capsule on top of it, this thing has a total crew capacity of three. Also, as we're on the boosters, are two Mark IIr radial mount parachutes. These are in addition to the Mark 16 parachute that I have on top of the capsule. Um, as mentioned, this is more than twice the mass of uh, 
the previous orbiter that Jeb flew, so I need the extra parachutes to get all three of these Kerbals back down safely. In fact, this thing actually still is made of two components. We have a service module on the bottom below that decoupler that's made up of the materials bay, that fuel tank, and the uh, Terrier engine. And then above that is sort of our crew section of it, including a heat shield, of course, um, and we'll be doing that separating when we come into re-entry. I did place those two radial parachutes uh, so that hopefully the whole crew module will land horizontally. We'll see how that goes uh, later in the video. Of course, this is our second time in orbit. Jeb was in orbit a couple of episodes ago and managed to collect himself some science. Got EVA reports over most of the biomes, though not these ones that we're going to be able to get in this polar orbit. I'm looking here to see if we have any waypoints coming up. All of those waypoints are places where we need to do crew reports. But it doesn't look like we have any coming up. In fact, it looked like we just missed some. So we're going to put our attention to collecting all the near science that we can. All the near space science. Of course, to do that, Bob's got to go out and clean up the equipment and get the science that we just collected. So why don't we cut ahead just a little bit where we found ourselves over the northern ice shelf. That's a new biome that came along with 1.2. There we go, collect that EVA report. And not long after that, we are over the ice cap. So there we go, another EVA to do. Collect that science. These, of course, are all ones Jeb couldn't get in the orbit that he was in. That's why we are in this polar orbit. Or another reason why. Oh, Tundra! We'll get that Tundra science too. There we go. Another EVA report. Excellent. So, let's take a closer look at X science. According to X science, the only near science we have left now is the southern ice shelf. Why don't we use this to take a look at the high science we got to collect? Looks like we got four, uh, temperature scan, pressure scan, mystery goo, and a materials bay. None of which are biome specific, so that's great. We'll just have to stick our nose up there, collect these, and then we can get ourselves back down. I do like X-Science for this ability. The search feature is really, really handy. Well, we might as well leave Bob where he is in the command capsule. Just don't touch anything, okay, Bob? Valentina doesn't seem too concerned. I think she thinks she can trust him. And it wasn't too long until we were over that southern ice cap. We can grab that EVA. And this is going to be it for Bob's EVAs for a little while. So we'll swap them back. Which of course means Bob's got to hang out a little bit while we transfer Valentina from the crew cabin to the command module. EVA her, get Bob back in, tr transfer Bob over to the crew cabin. Uh, and then get Valentina back in. And once we were done all that, well, I went back to map view and sort of took a look at what was going to be the first waypoint we were going to come over. It looks like Dinkle something or other. So we'll use the waypoint manager here. There it is, Dinkelstein's Cavern. That's going to be our first one. So we'll begin time warping and took about Another two and a half orbits later, we can come out of time warp. We'll just get the uh, menu for the crew cabin here, or the command capsule, pin it over here, get ready to do a crew report. I do like how the waypoint manager gives us our distance to the target. You can see now we're under, well under 90 kilometers. And I'm just watching the distance. Oh dear, the distance is now going up. Oh, I think we have passed our, yeah, yeah, we passed it. We didn't get close enough there. We got to 84.1 kilometers and that's it. And by the time I time warped around again, well, we were way on the other side of the thing. So we missed this on this time around. So we went and selected the next one that was coming up, which is Bob's gift. There we go. By the time I time warped over to that, no, we didn't get close enough to this one either and blew on by. And in fact, after repeating this a number of times, it wasn't until we're on the second day of this mission 
And on our 16th orbit that we finally got our first one, it's Listy's, Listy's Frontier. Here we go. It looks like we have to get underneath 60 kilometers from the waypoint. I'm starting to think getting all nine of these might take a little longer than I originally anticipated. But you know what? Why don't we uh, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about how I'm going to get this stage back, that booster stage that we separated earlier, how I'm going to end up recovering that and getting back most of the funds from that stage. So I'm here in the tracking station and I've selected that booster. And I'll let you know as well, this is after I completed the whole mission. So I'm showing you things out of order. And most of the waypoints that you see here, actually almost all of them are for missions that I picked up after completing the mission that we just left. So we'll get back to that mission. I'm doing things a little bit out of order because I figured this would be a pretty anticlimactic way to end the video just with the recovering of this stage. So this thing's gonna stay in orbit even though the periapsis is in the atmosphere because the periapsis is above uh, the altitude that KSP will automatically remove it. And what I'm doing is I'm time warping until my periapsis is in a position that I think will get it pretty close to the KSC when it comes back down. And that huge cluster of waypoints you see there are all actually pretty close to where the KSC is. So I think my periapsis is coming into the right position now. So I'm just waiting until my altitude is above 70 kilometers and that makes it safe to switch to the vehicle. Now this vehicle has absolutely no control on it. There's no probe body, there's no uh, communication, there's no electricity. It's, it's completely a dead, inert, dumb object. But remember that I did engage or arm those parachutes before uh, staging. And those parachutes are still armed. So all I need to do now is time warp until we enter into the atmosphere, which we just did. And now that this is the active vehicle, uh, atmospheric physics are going to start to apply to it. So I'm taking advantage of the fact, some people might say I'm exploiting the fact, that KSP only applies uh, physics to objects that are actually rendered, not to objects that are beyond the rendering distance. And you can see what it's doing, it's starting to swing itself around so that it is going in engine first. And uh, that's what it's going to do because the engine is the heaviest part. And because we are still high up in the atmosphere, um, the aerodynamic forces on those tail fins aren't really adding too much to this right now. So it's going to orient itself with the heaviest part downwards. And that is good because the engine of all the parts that are on this thing can take the most amount of heat. The engines are designed to get hot. Now, as the air gets thicker, we'll hop a little bit further down in the atmosphere. You can say, see things are getting pretty hot. That's okay. Things seem to be all right. The engine is definitely taking the worst of it. It can handle it. All those other temperature gauges are fuel tanks and the tail fins. I, if the tail fins blow up, I'd be fine with that, to be quite honest. I don't think the parachutes have a temperature gauge on them at all. There they go. Awesome, excellent, and I didn't stage that. They did that, I'm, I'm, I'm doing absolutely nothing with this. This thing is completely on its own. Oh, oh, now the tail fins are really starting to kick in now. <laughs> it's really, it wants to turn. Man, those, there's a lot of lift on those tail fins. Oh, now it is actually going up. That's remarkable. Oh, there we go. Now it's settling back down as it slows down a bit. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. We should take a look at where we are. How close do we get to the Kerbal Space Center? Oh, that's not bad. This is the Kerbal Space Center over here. So we're in the ocean over there towards the, to the east of it. Excellent. And now they have fully deployed. And the rest of this is easy peasy. You do want to do your best to put this down in the water. It's very likely to 
touch down or splash down and then fall over if it's in the water chances are everything is going to be okay if it's on the land chances are it'll fall over and something will break but this actually upon recovery it doesn't give you any kind of report on recovery but if you compare the cost before and after recovery you can actually figure out how much money you earned back this earned me back 5345 per buck not bad anyway let's get ourselves back to the mission where we rejoin our valiant crew now on day five of the mission and in the midst of their 52nd orbit where they finally cross over the halfway point picking up dinkelstein's discovery which actually finished off the first of the three contracts here but it wasn't until the 74th orbit on day seven where i finally had enough and after picking up bill's gift completing the second of the three contracts leaving two waypoints still to go but both of them are virtually right on top of each other so they're likely to be able to be gotten at the same time and i figured i can take that plane from last episode and take a shot at flying over there and seeing if i can get it with that but first i want to finish off this mission and we still have one more leg to go. I want to get some high space science, which involves pushing my apoapsis up above 250 kilometers. Ooh, we're getting pretty close to the KSC. That's the KSC right there. Those are the two waypoints I still got to do. There are two there. And I want to do the burn so that my periapsis will uh, be fairly close to the KSC. I think this is pretty good. This is kind of the same sort of thing as what you just saw me do with that booster stage. We're going to burn prograde here, and then as soon as we get up to apoapsis, we're going to do our science, and then we're going to uh, bring our periapsis into the atmosphere, and I'm hoping this is going to get us pretty close to the Kerbal Space Center for recovery. So we'll orient ourselves prograde, and then we'll just do the burn keeping an eye on our apoapsis and once we're over 250 kilometers that's going to be it there we go 255 kilometers and then it was just a quick time warp up there to collect the temperature scan pressure scan mystery goo and a materials bay and then it was time to get these folks back home so we flipped ourselves around to retrograde and burned until our periapsis was into the atmosphere. We go about 30 kilometers, that should do it. And as we were entering into the atmosphere, came time to stage the service module. There it goes. Now we can talk a little bit about why I do have the extra set of reaction wheels. You see this thing, it, it left to its own devices, it would orient itself prograde, going down nose first, and that means going down with that forward parachute first. That would not be a good thing, so I have to hold it here onto the retrograde vector to keep everything good. And at first, Valentina didn't have any issues. She was having no trouble hanging on and keeping it too retrograde, but as the air thickened, oh my goodness, if this thing want to flip around the other way, and it did look a little bit hairy. I didn't want to expose those parachutes to too much heat or else we were in a lot of trouble. But pretty soon the shock heating was over, and it was just a matter of waiting until the parachutes at least semi-deployed. Turned out I was over the highlands. I didn't get myself down into the water where I wanted. I'm actually over the highlands just on the other side of the mountains from the KSC. So I am close to the KSC where I was able to pick up a little bit more science. And of course, once we touch down onto the surface nice and softly, we were able to get some more science right there. And then upon recovery, well, this whole mission netted me 181.7 science for a total of 220 science as well. Val, Bill, and Bomb now join Jeb as level one carbonauts. And then I did end up sending out Jeb in the mission four plane that you saw last episode. And I'll show you the highlights from that next episode because this one is getting too long. But he did up the science up to 275 science. So into research and development, I went to get electrics for solar panels. Yes, those static solar panels, I do really want those. Uh, an SAS compatible probe core, inline battery, radiators, and lots of lights. 
and then propulsion systems for small rocket engines and the little Oscar F B fuel tank. And then aerodynamics for better plane parts, including better intakes, the inline cockpit, and the Weasley jet engines. And after filling up my contracts once again, uh, I ended up with enough money to up the tracking station up to level 2. This gives me patched conics. And my ground station goes from 2G to 50G for communications. I don't know exactly what that means, but it does sound like... Well, it's 25 times better, right? <laughs> I would think that's the way it works. And all told now, I have 153067 per bucks in which to plan my next mission. And I think maybe it's time to aim a little higher. But that's going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.